Yo, what's up, everyone? We have an amazing guest on today's show who has a very interesting story and a lot of good things to share. And her name is Nadia Khalil Bradley. Nadia began her journey in a tight knit Palestinian American community located in the suburb of Chicago. A devout Muslim, she followed the traditions upheld in the community and within the culture, having very little knowledge of Christ. And she had been writing to God for years, and then one day, boom, she claims God answered her. And in 2002, while still a Muslim, Nadia had a vision of Christ while she was in a restaurant out of all places that literally changed her life forever and has been sharing her story ever since. And she's a host of a podcast show on Blog Talk Radio called Christisms. And her books include Little Wing, Origins of Truth, and her latest, Original Love. Nadia, it's great to have you on the show. It's great to be here, Joshua. Thank you for having me. All right. You know, several <laughs> years ago, I had these really radical paradigm shifts of how I saw God and the world and religion. And I remember one day stumbling upon your video on YouTube called Jesus Speaks to a Muslim Woman. And as I watched it, I was like, whoa, <laughs> you know, not only was it an amazing encounter that you had, but it also confirmed a lot of things I was starting to believe. And so I started sharing your story with a lot of my, my friends. And even during my speaking engagements, I would share your story because there's just something about stories like yours and real life experiences that people have that can impact a person in ways that arguments and debates just can't. And so I never forgot your story. And it's crazy because just about two weeks ago, I mm -hmm. was at the mall with my wife <laughs> near my home. And then I saw you and I was like, hey, that's the woman from the YouTube video. And then yep. my wife and I, we approached you and you were so nice. And then we eventually met up, you know, on another day at Starbucks and we got to hear each other's stories. And I just knew I got to have you on the show. And so here we are. And so I'd like for you to share your story with my listeners, if you can, and, and how and where you grew up your religious background, and the events that led up to what you can call the quote-unquote defining moment. And if you can go into detail of what exactly happened during that encounter so we could sort of get a feel for it. Well, it's actually a much simpler story than you'd expect. Oh, right. um, because we all have, you know, the ways we grew up and where we grew up and what our parents taught us and how embedded it is in us. Mm -hmm. that we don't even know the difference between us and what we were taught because we are what we were taught. Mm -hmm. And I was raised in an Arabic community with very few Arabs. So I was born Muslim, but I didn't learn about Islam per se in the beginning because mm -hmm. there wasn't anybody in our area to teach us. Oh, and my okay. parents were fourth and fifth grade education and they were hard workers you know, how immigrants are when they first come, sure. especially in the 50s, you know, where you mm -hmm. can take two or three jobs. And, and, you know, both my parents, my mom had two, my dad had three jobs. Wow. And, um, and we didn't speak English, um, because they didn't speak English. Mm -hmm. And yet we were in America. Yeah. And as we got older, and I started communicating with people outside my family, I realized, wow, you know, everybody is different like really different, like nobody <laughs> lives like us, like, wait a minute, what's going on? And I realized that there was one thing in common that we all had. And that was that we all wanted to be happy, no matter what our backgrounds told us to be, or to do, or what we can't do, or what we can do, and why, and why it's so bad, or why it's so good. I realized that people only wanted to show their good, but they were embarrassed about a lot of of their lives or did not talk about it or did not seek help if they needed it because they were so scared of being bad. Hmm. And I remember thinking, but God is for everybody because how come my neighbor can dance yeah. at a wedding and my other neighbor can't and we have belly dancers at our wedding? <laughs> like, why is that? Or why can't they eat everything? Like they don't eat what my parents eat, but I don't eat pork. And mm. you know, that's against my religion. But what happens to them if they eat it? Because it's not against their religion. Yeah. And little things like that, because I was a kid. So I was just looking at the practical part of it. Mm. And then I remember one day, I still remember because we lived by a lot of prairies and I was standing in a prairie 
And I wanted something and I can't remember what it was. I think it was my own bike because I had so many brothers and sisters. We never got our own anything. <laughs> and I wanted my own bike so that whenever I wanted to ride, I would have the bike available to me. And I asked for that. And I said, you know, God, I want a bike. I need a bike. Mm. And then I thought, wow, I want something. And it's the first time in my life that I was conscious <laughs> of wanting something outside yeah. of myself or my family or food. Right. And I, so I wanted this bike and I stood there and I go, wow, if I want something, that means other people might want something. Hmm. So God, don't just give me what I want, hmm. but give everybody what they want hmm. because they're just me wanting something too. And what yeah. would be wrong with that? Yeah. And I remember thinking outside of myself for the first time, but I never felt like God belonged to anyone. Hmm. Whenever I spoke, I, I would speak to God that we were all the same. I never saw the differences past what I was taught. But right. somehow that didn't matter to me because I already figured out in my mind that no matter what our religion told us to do, God was in charge of all of it. So it didn't matter if I was born this or that. I just needed to be the best person I can be. And somehow I lived on that premise. But then when I became 13 and 14 and 15, people started moving from the Arabic countries to Chicago. And my mom was so desperate for us to learn about our background that she started a school and had people teach us about our background. So they taught us to pray five times a day. They taught us the short prayers. They taught us geographically where we were from because a lot of us never left Chicago. Hmm. And so we would sit in this school and they told us about how bad it would be and what kind of punishment we would have if we didn't pray and if we didn't do this and if we didn't do that. And I remember leaving going, but I felt so good about God before. And now I'm scared of God. Hmm. And now I feel like I have to be good. Right, right. Otherwise I'm bad. Hmm. Like there is no in between. There is no you know, you're a good person and do your best. It's more like you better do these things. And then I started thinking, but if I came here just to do all of that and everyone has to do the same thing, then why did we come? Yeah. Like, what's the point of us being here? Hmm. But sure enough, I fell into that I wanted to be a good Muslim I wanted to be good for my parents. I didn't want anyone to be mad at me or think bad of me. I didn't want to take my family down for being myself. Hmm. So I just became them. I just did what they wanted. And around 20 years old, I couldn't keep up. The demands were too many. And the older I got, the weirder it was because I started becoming a person, but I wasn't allowed to be a person. My background said I couldn't do the things I desired. I wanted to finish college. I didn't want to get married right away because I was afraid that that would take me away from the things I needed to get done. Yet people were coming to ask for my hand in marriage. And so now I'm being looked at as bad for rejecting these people. But I was concerned that if I did get married, that I would not be able to complete my education. But then I started growing even more and I wanted to see somebody. I met somebody at school and I, I came back and I told my parents because I didn't want to lie. I didn't want to lie. So I told them the truth and that truth got me in more trouble than if I never said a thing about what I felt or did or wanted. And before I knew it, the head of the mosque was at our house for dinner telling me why I cannot have a boyfriend and how bad that is and how people just use each other. And, <laughs> and, and I was really, you know, right at the height of my passion and my desire in life. I was told I couldn't have that unless it was, in quotes, the right way. Hmm. And then I was getting followed. And then there were threats on my life. People going to my boss at work saying, if she does this, we're going to make an example out of her. How they heard about it, I don't know. But my boss was more scared for me than I was. Mm. I couldn't believe that somebody would want to hurt me. Who would I hurt? Hmm. I loved people. Hmm. But what happened was, as life went on, sure enough, I became part of a marriage 
um, the, the cultural way, I did agree to marry someone because I did not want my whole family, which that responsibility got put on my shoulders. I did not want my family to be looked at in the community as a bad family because their daughter actually did what she wanted to do. And so I went along and the relief I felt that everybody was happy was what paid my heart back. Mm. Was that the man that married me was happy. That made me happy. The way that my parents were happy, the way they felt proud of me, the way they talked about me to people. I learned to respond to that because being bad was so bad. So I got married and when he was a lot older than me, and he was an engineer, and I was a free spirit. Mm. So um, it was a very difficult time for me. He was very strict. He, um, I was like a child. I wasn't like a partner or a wife. Mm. I was, you know, basically told, you don't look good, go change, you know, things like that. Um, mm. You know, that everything that was wrong with me was highlighted, but things that were right with me were not. Mm. And I was put down a lot in the marriage to the point where I stopped eating, I stopped talking, and the only love I felt was for my children. Hmm. But what happened in that time was that I did not have anyone to talk to. I moved from Chicago to California. All of my friends except for two were his friends that I inherited that were all probably some old enough to be my parents, some just older than me. Hmm. So I found this warmth and this love, waking up in the middle of the night and writing to God. And I would write to God how much I loved my family, how much I loved my husband, how I didn't understand why he was angry all the time at me. And I took it upon myself that something was wrong with me because in our culture we're raised that if your husband isn't happy, it's your fault. Mm. So I took that on initially, and I kept trying to be better until I wore myself out. Once again, I hit the same wall, but still didn't learn that I can walk through that wall. But what happened to me is when I started writing to God, I felt this freedom that I never felt before. Because when you write to God or you talk to God, you know God sees everything. It's an innate feeling. No one has to tell you that. You just know. And what you know starts coming alive, the real stuff, the fact that God is there. Because I felt listened to. I felt heard. And I would write about how sad I was at times. And it would give me the strength to make it through the next day. Hmm. And that's all I did was took it one day at a time. Because that's all I could take at that point. I was overwhelmed with the responsibilities of everybody else and their expectations of me that I couldn't even get to myself. Mm. And I didn't realize that when you cannot take care of yourself first, that you really cannot, in truth, take care of anyone ultimately. Mm. And that's exactly what happened. Because I started to fall apart not knowing I was. I was getting thinner and thinner. I was probably in a depression and didn't know. I didn't eat. I didn't want to bathe. Me taking off all the layers of clothes I had to put on to stay warm because I'd gotten so thin. Hmm. I stopped having the desire to interact with people because I just was too tired. I didn't have the energy. And as time went on, one of my husband's friends saw me and said, you know what, you need to leave the house for a couple of weeks and give her some time, Mm -hmm. some time to gain some weight, some time to recoup, and then, you know, you can come back. And he left the house, and I knew that he was never coming back. Hmm. I knew it. And all the stuff I was carrying walked out of the door with him, It just walked out with him. And I knew that I was free, but I didn't know how to get there yet. I didn't know how to be able to feel it. In the meantime, I kept writing every night. I, I couldn't wait to wake up and write. 
because now that became my playground. I was understood. I felt loved. I felt like this life here was just this life here, but that wasn't who I was. Mm -hmm. And as time went on in that time, I knew that I had to take this opportunity because now he was feeling a little bit in control to file for divorce and make sure that that happened. Mm -hmm. And he signed the papers to humor me, almost like it was a game, but I knew it wasn't a game. I never played games. But when people play games, they think you're playing games. Mm -hmm. So I took that opportunity and I would write to God like, I've never been alone. I've never had anyone have a lease on me that I had to give them this time. I had to give my parents this time. I had to give this man this time. But how do I even know who I am with my own time? Yeah. So I went on this, like, this journey of just like I felt so much peace. I loved just staying home and cooking and sitting with my kids. And, you know, granted, I got a lot of trouble for the divorce and all of that. But mm. I shut it out and only talk to God in that time. And all I do is ask God questions. Well, how come someone feels that they have the right to take another soul's rights away from them? You know, how is it that somebody can be so angry and then tell someone they're doing things they're not doing, but really believe that that person's doing them because they're doing them? You know, I had these questions, tons of questions, and I never felt... Like I got an answer the next day, but I would meet somebody who would tell me of something similar and I'd be like, oh my God, that's how I get my answers. <laughs> and then I realized that God talks to us through each other. Mm. What I never expected was that I would actually hear God. So as I was writing to God and I, I, I did get divorced and all those are all stories within themselves, but this one I'm focusing on God. Mm -hmm. because it's the most important of all of them, mm -hmm. was how God really does hear us, really is there, and responds to our every whim. And when we pay attention, we realize that that's what's happening. And as time went on, I would talk to people, and they'd start saying things to me, people I didn't know, that, you know, there's something around you or there's this light around you. And I thought they were crazy <laughs> because I never delved into anything metaphysical, anything spiritual. All I knew was that, okay, I'm Muslim, but right now I'm kind of, you know, at arm's length because I want to feel good about God. Mm. I don't want to be scared of God. I didn't reject it. I accepted that that's who I am but I didn't want to not feel like I was close to God, yeah. that I didn't have a relationship with God. And the only way I could do that was taking away all of the stuff that we added in that God did not put in himself, that we were told God put in so that we would be scared enough to do it. Mm -hmm. So as I was going on in life, I would meet I worked at a job where I had literally lunch for a living. I kept relationships open between my company and, and these companies that we worked with. So I would take them out to lunch. And after lunch, I'd fe feel compelled in the middle of the day, which was new, to go and write. Hmm. So I would book all my appointments in the morning, have lunch, and go sit at a park and write for about an hour to two hours sometimes by hand. And then go back to work, plug in what I did all day, and go home, pick up my kids, and that was my day every day. And I realized, my God, I'm writing a lot, and, and I'm learning from my writing, but where is it coming from? Hmm. And then one day, I had a client, it was my birthday, and she asked me to go out for dinner for my birthday. I said, sure, I would love to. There was a new restaurant that opened in a town called Monrovia, California, and we went hmm. And she was a little late coming to the um, dinner and I was waiting for her and she came and she said, you know, I'm really sorry. I had an appointment with my therapist, but I'm okay. And whatever. She sat down. I didn't ask her any more questions and we started eating dinner. And she told me every time I'm with you, something happens. I don't know exactly what it is, but I get so distracted from the stuff I'm thinking about because I can only think about what we're talking about. 
And I said, well, wow, that's great. That means like you're, you're present. You know, it's not like I said, is that what people do? Do they think about other things when they're with people, you know, and, and it was surprising me, but we were speaking and talking. We had a great dinner. We finished, we paid for the check and we were sitting in front of each other. And all of a sudden I felt this warmth. It was just like a, a wind blew the way it feels on the outside of you but I felt it on the inside of me. It didn't give me chills or anything. It was just a warmth. And before I knew it, between myself and Christine, there was a light. When that light was in front of me, I knew everything. Every single thing I could think of, I just knew it as though it was common knowledge I didn't feel this feeling like, oh my God, now I know this and I could use this or none of that happened to me. I just knew everything and it felt completely normal Mm -hmm. to know everything. And then the light faded for a second and I didn't know everything. And then I didn't feel normal. And then I felt like I had a lot to learn. It was almost like, where did that knowledge just go? Where did it go? And I, you want to recapture it, yeah. but it's not yours to recapture, at least not yet. Yeah. So then Christine, who's looking at me, said to me, you should see your face right now. And I said, you didn't see it? And she said, no, what? And I said, there was a light between us. Before I could finish talking, I had that light again, and in it was a face. The face didn't move. The eyes were closed. The mouth was closed. It almost looked like the head was tilted forward a little bit, kind of down, and the hair was lit gold, Hmm. like yellow with light, which made it look gold. Hmm. And a bunch of layers of white looked like white material facing inward towards the neck, And then all I could see was up to the waist, one hand, the left underneath the right, the right being over it, and just complete peace. So was it just like floating in midair? Nope, just in front of me, not moving, in the light, within the light. And the And the white of the structure of the face was whiter than the white behind it, which was how I could tell it was. It was just different shades of white or different densities, I should say, of white. Mm -hmm. And... I looked and he said, I am Christ. And for a minute, because I'm Muslim, I didn't have a reference for the word Christ that quickly. My reference, if he would have said, I'm Jesus, I would have gotten it in a second because that was terminology I was used to hearing. But he just didn't move and waited for me to catch up. (laughs) It didn't, it wasn't like he tried to explain himself or say anything. And the other thing that, I think was really interesting about it was it happened so easily. Mm. Like you would think, you know, how we see movies and things shake and, you know, things start changing around (laughs) you and all of that. None of that. It literally happened so simply that it felt completely normal for me to be there. Mm. Although I did think he came to the wrong person once I figured out that it was, you know, Jesus Christ. (laughs) Because I'm like, well, wait a minute, I'm Muslim. Again, that quiet wait, waiting for me to catch up to, Mm. oh, that doesn't matter. Mm. That doesn't matter. And then he told me, he said, your job is to bridge people's souls back to them. And I thought, what? (laughs) Bridge people's souls? Who? Who? Whose souls and why do people need that? And what does that even mean? Again, the quiet. (laughs) And I love how he didn't answer every question I had. He could already see me. He could see everything that's going on. But he knew it was important for me to see it. And that's what I felt. (laughs) And in that moment, when I did know everything... As long as he was in front of me, I was open to that knowledge. Hmm. And the girl who was in front of me, Christine, who came from that therapist's appointment, who didn't discuss her problem with me at all, he addressed her through me. 
Mm-hmm. And he told her why her relationship with her father was the way it was. And he told her that out of the eight kids that they had, that she was the most like him. And because of that, he felt he had to push her harder. He would be more upset with her than with others if she didn't do what she was going to do because he knew her capabilities. Hmm. But on the outside, it looked like her dad loved her the least. On the outside, it looked like she had huge issues because of her dad, who's still alive and well, even till today. So while I was talking to her, she was asking me to repeat myself. But because it was Christ talking through me, I didn't repeat anything. I just kept going. And once she realized that that was happening, she pulled out her checkbook and was writing down as much of what I was saying as she could on the deposit slips of her checkbook. (laughs) If you could imagine, which she told me she still has till today. (laughs) But after that, she wanted to get up and leave me. And I looked at her and I go, don't leave me just yet. Because if you leave me, I'm going to be alone. And I don't want to be alone (laughs) if this happens to me again. I don't know what to do. And I got to still go home. And I'm going to be by myself when I go home. And before we could finish that conversation, the restaurant was winding down and closing. The owner of the restaurant came straight to me. And he asked me if I would like a glass of wine. Now, our bill was paid. Hmm. Why he came to me, I can't tell you. But I can tell you he offered me wine. Hmm. And I was just about, because I'm Muslim, going to turn around and tell him, no, thank you. I don't drink. Before I could do that, sure enough, the light comes back. Christ (laughs) is back in front of me. (laughs) And he says, accept it, for it's given to you with love and purity. Hmm. So I said, yes, thank you. And he went and he got me in a little plate, this little cup of this very sweet wine. Now I know it was port wine. I didn't know at the time. And it was good. And I drank almost all of it. But, <laughs> you know, I left a little bit at the bottom. It was a lot for me. You know, I've never, I never really drank. Yeah. And when he came back to our table, he looked at Christine and said, I am sorry, I didn't even see you. Would you like something to drink? And she looked at him and she said, I would love champagne. And he brought her champagne and we had our drink. And I will tell you, every time I saw that man after that, because I brought clients there for lunch after that, Hmm. He would run up to me and hug me. And I never told him what happened, even till this day, what happened in his restaurant. Hmm. I told him after I wrote the first book, and he came to the book signing, and he was so proud of the fact that I read the book. I said, when you read it, if you read it, I have a story to tell you. And he never asked me. I don't know if he ever read it. But the love was there. The connection was there. It's amazing that whether it's spoken about or not, that connection we feel with people, when we feel that connection, is the way we can feel with God. We don't have to be scared. Because I'll tell you what was missing from when I saw Christ. What was missing was judgment. What was missing was I told you so's. What was missing was if you just didn't do that. What was missing was a feeling of not feeling loved. There was nothing scary. There was no threat of a hell. There was no threat of if I wasn't good. There was no comment on me being good or bad about anything. There was no judgment on any decision I'd ever made. And I found out I was the bigger judge than God. That I was harder on myself than God was on me. God doesn't ask much of us. But he does tell us what will make our lives fuller 
and richer hmm. and more exciting for us because while we're here, we have choices to live that way, but why aren't we? Yeah. And I get asked questions instead of given answers, <laughs> which I thought was really interesting. One of the first questions Christ asked me was, who would you be if everybody you knew didn't know you? Hmm. That's a hard question to answer because we are so reactive to our environments and to the people in our lives. Who would I have been if I wasn't told I was Muslim? If I wasn't told I couldn't do what I wanted because otherwise I would upset an entire community of people? What would I be doing? Where would I be living? How would I be contributing to my life that contributes to other people's lives? Can I contribute to other people's lives if I haven't done so for myself? Those questions, all he did from the day I saw him until this very day is ask me questions hmm. and allows me to answer them. He doesn't answer for me. He's made it very clear that every soul has its greatest asset, its most valuable asset, and that is its very own free will. Mm -hmm. Nobody on earth has anybody else's free will. We try to. We try to break that down so that people will listen to us. But that is our most valuable asset, and it is never interfered with, not even by God. Otherwise, there's no point. Think about that. Yeah. So when you when you had this encounter, it was you you talked about how you had the sense of um, you just knew, seemed like you felt like you knew everything, and uh, you sense this. Uh, there's this non-judgment. You know, and so was there this also this overwhelming feeling of love, like unconditional love? Like was it was it, it was, an overwhelming thing or not not so much? Um, it was probably more overwhelming than I could take in mm. to be loved that much, and nothing to be asked for it. Yeah, not even you know me censoring my own behavior to get that love as a reward. Yeah, that love is already there right? for every single person who's listening, who can hear this, and for every single person who is not listening yeah. and cannot hear this, that love that you feel, it takes you a while to be able to wrap your mind around being loved in that way. Yeah. Being loved so quietly that it is your most powerful force. Mm. Because when somebody or anybody or God or Christ can love you without the demands of you proving that love, that love is free to be what it is. And what it is is nothing that we were taught. Yeah, We were taught love is your car in a driveway, a brand new one with a bow on it <laughs> or a ring in a box. Yeah. Or you got to do this. We are taking love and saying that if you didn't do that, you are not loving me right. Yeah. But the love itself has nothing to do with anything. And that's something Christ kept saying is love is love is love. Hmm. It is the relationships that are different. I might have a different relationship with my child than I do with my husband, than I do with my coworker, than I do with my mom, than I do with my sister or brother, but the relationships are different. But once I understood that me loving somebody had nothing to do with what I had to do to prove it, mm. I gained emotional freedom 
in a way that took me and is still taking me years to uncover more freedom that actually exists for us through knowing that we can love ourselves enough to pay attention to ourselves enough to do the things we want to do in mm. our lives and right. to be able to love the people around us that way. Mm. If somebody gets married because now they're married and then they get married and they say, well, we're married now, so you have to love me. Right. God help you if you do anything wrong to me because then you'll owe me. Yeah. And there's some really hard, true comments that no soul owns and owes or owns another soul ever. Hmm. But somehow we feel a sense of ownership in people. We feel that marriage will guarantee love. Hmm. But marriage is really a partnership of two souls who see the world the same way and can grow in each world, in each of their worlds, enough to share that love in a combined world that you both create. Hmm. But if one is missing something and you're filling that hole for them, what happens when that hole is filled? Yeah. You outgrow each other. But we are not evolved enough to say we outgrew each other. We say nothing and then we wait for things to break down and then we blame each other and then there's a lot of money to be made on the other side of marriage, which is now a very common thing, and that's divorce. Yeah. And now, even, some people can't afford to get divorced. Look at how that's evolved. Hmm. And the average divorce is between twenty six and $56,000, hmm. unless the two people can agree. So there's a lot of money to be made on anger. There's a lot of money to be made on insecurity. But there's no money to be made on pure love because people will understand enough to know that, my God, we, we did outgrow each other. It's not like their fault. I feel it too. I just didn't want to admit it because then I feel like if this didn't work, I failed. Right. So the way I look at things is not the same. And what's interesting to me is after seeing Christ... And I continue to see him because once that barrier is broken, it's broken. Sometimes it's just nice to hear him comment on things because I remember I was married a second time and my husband had complications of leukemia throughout the marriage. It started four months after we were married and it mm -hmm. continued and I inherited four children on top of my two. So he's in the hospital. I have six kids. Mm -hmm. And in that time, when you would think I had the least amount of time in life, I wrote Origins of Truth, mm -hmm. a 654 page book that you'd say, when? <laughs> I wrote it in the middle of the night, waking up again, asking God questions because Christ told me when I saw him that first time that I would write books and that would be how I communicated this information. Yeah. And while I was writing at night, asking God questions because now I could, I could see my next question that I needed to answer through that through the, the issues we had with the kids, through the problems the children were having. Their mother left them little and they had a, a lot of problems. But you know what happened in that time was that I was called out on everything my ego tried to jump into. Mm. Why do you want to talk to that child this way? What do you think would work better? And then when I realized that we really didn't have a marriage and we became partners, I mean, he was in the hospital literally for four years on and off mm -hmm. and replacing body parts and all of these things that we had to go through. And we both knew that. And he said to me, we got together to do this work. I said, isn't that funny? When I met you, that was the first thing we told each other. If we're not together, this one, whatever work we had to do would not be done. We had no idea it was books. Mm. And while I was writing at night, I said, I thought you said I was going to write books. Mm. When am I going to start? 
And all I got was, you've already written them. And I'm like, what did I write? <laughs> he said, what you're writing right now. I'm like, no way. <laughs> No way. This is way too personal. I've named names. I've said things I would, I would be embarrassed to tell anyone. And he said, so is everybody else. That's why they need to hear this. Nobody talks about self-love. This was now going to be 14 years ago in April. No one talked about self-love 14 years ago. No one talked about self-accounting in this way. We had a lot of self-help books out there. If you just do this and stick to this, and it, it was hard to fit it into life between work and home and everything you had to do. Yeah. But he never told me how to do yeah. anything. So, so when you hear him now and you see him now, is it the same kind of way that you saw him the first time, like a tangible, you see a light kind of thing. And like when you hear him, um, like in what sense, like do you hear his voice? Is it like an internal voice, like in your head or a sense of knowing? Or is it? does it feel like it's well, an external audible voice? That <laughs> That's a good question because his voice is much calmer than my own, okay. which is why I know it's him because mm -hmm. then I'm like, oh, yeah, there you are. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I, I can't say I'm used to it. Mm -hmm. I'm always amazed every single time it happens, even if it happens five times in a day. Yeah. I'm still amazed. It's sometimes I'm driving and I go, how could it be? Mm. But it, it happens so easily that I know he's around everybody. Right. Maybe not everyone is meant to hear him because it would be too distracting. And mm -hmm. their life's purpose is something else. And mine just happened to be to talk about it. Right, right. But he made it very clear that I was not more special than any other soul on earth. Yeah. That there is no soul more important than another. And that no soul, not even you, not even anyone who thinks, yeah, but everybody else right. is left behind. Now, yeah. when I see him, it will be when I'm the most quiet. Because, okay. you know, we get busy. I'm at work, I'm at home, I'm cleaning, I'm cooking, I'm visiting. But I will tell you, he just shows up. I could see him as quiet as I saw him that first time. Although now it's a little different because now once in a while I'll see him and I'll actually see an eyeball, like I'll see the eyes. Because the first time I saw him, it was just stoic. Mm. And now I don't see him walking or anything. He just comes in recognizable form so that I just know it's him. Mm. It's amazing. Because yeah. he told me he's an angel of love. His entire job is love. Yeah. Yeah. And that's... Oh, go on. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, because, uh, you know, like for me growing up as a Christian, you know, a lot of Christians claim that God speaks to them too, which is usually through like... To say something like it's an impression, or God speaks through circumstances, or the Bible, or like, quote unquote a still small voice, and some claim to hear God audibly, as if it's like some sort of external voice that they're hearing. And so, from what I'm I've observed many times, it's like they would use a phrase "God told me so" just to to justify kind of their own desires, or sometimes even their selfish desires. You know, for example, they want something. And they'll say, God told me to do such and such, you know. And so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's like that. That's a question that I think a lot of people would have. You know, how do you know it's Christ and not just your ego or just a thought in your head that's kind of random? Um, that you know, how do you know it's not just you? You know, that is probably a question that people think and don't ask me. But okay. sometimes I'll get attacked. Like, oh, well, <laughs> she's making a ton of money from this. I'm like, sure, I've, never, sure. I've never made a penny. Yeah, yeah. This has cost me, I want to say, more money than I've probably ever saved in my life right. to talk about this and to do it. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how I am not even allowed, I think, in many ways, in any way, actually, to have made an income from this. Mm. There is no income from this. Every book I've published, 
I've paid for more than I've gotten back. Hmm. I mean, there's no way that you pay 150000 to publish a book. That was the loan I took. Hmm. But by the time that loan's paid off, it's going to be 300 and something thousand. Right. And where does that money show up? You get it back in six dollars a time. Um, so no, it's it. This has nothing to do with the money. It has nothing to do with anything I could ever ask for back. Sure. I'm only sharing the love that I know exists because of what has happened to me. Yeah. yeah. I didn't start anything. I didn't put anything anywhere. I didn't. I just put the information out. In the only ways I can, I do a radio show five days a week, right. and I talk about the stuff Christ talks to me about. It's called Christisms because right. I, I don't even feel to take the credit away from where it's coming. Yeah. Yes, it's combined with me. Yes, it's part of my job. But when I hear him, it's so subtle and so soft and so beautiful that I can't help but share it, and it doesn't just get shared with my mouth, it gets shared with who I've become as a result of it. Right, right. And the books that I write, they, they come from what I went through. Origins of Truth was written with my blood. Hmm. I was going, if there is ever a hell, I was going through that when I wrote that book. Yeah. And all I got was love back, which taught yeah. me to see the love in everything. I had, when I was asked to write the foreword for Origins of Truth, I was negative $400 in the bank. Hmm. And I didn't know how to start the foreword without saying that. And I said, today I write this, and I'm $400 negative in the bank. Hmm. And I trust that I'm going to be okay because I am okay today. Yeah, That yeah. didn't define me. If I died today, that would blow away in a puff of smoke. Right. But what would stay is the love, the love that I shared, the love that I am, the place that I'm going. This is a really a big here and now. Yeah. But we have been taught to be so scared that if certain things happen to us, that we won't survive. But I'm right. going to tell you right now, it's not easy to die. Right. <laughs> it's not. Mm. There were times I slept and said, I would rather just leave. <laughs> Because it right. was so hard. Sure. It was hard. It didn't mean that there isn't love in it because it's hard. It didn't mean I'm being punished because it was hard. It didn't mean I didn't get what everyone else got because it was hard. Yeah. I would have rather not been anywhere else than where I was. Yeah. Because that love is that powerful and that's why I'm talking about it. Yeah. Do I need anything back from it? No. Do I interview? Hardly ever. Yeah. Do I do the talk show? Yes, because all I wanted was a forum to talk about it. Sure. That's my only goal. Yeah. Whatever comes of it, comes of it. I am going to tour the world at some point and speak. I'm like getting my passport. I'm really excited <laughs> about it. Nice. My kids are finally grown <laughs> and don't need me all the time. So now I feel that I can see people in person. Nice. But what I want to do when I see them is just look into their eyes when I talk to them. That's all I want. Yeah. There is nothing anybody can give me greater than us sharing that love together yeah. and knowing that it exists for real. Knowing that we don't have to compromise us, ourselves, our dreams, our desires to be loved. Hmm. We are loved already. Yeah. So when I see him, believe it or not, remember that big light I saw before I saw him? Yeah. Now I just see him. Hmm. It's very, very yeah. um, easy. It's almost like when I see people. Hmm. Um, and it's not ever um, when just times are bad. You know how people think, sure. you know, he comes when things are bad. Yeah. Nope. He shows up when things are just as good. Yeah. We don't have to just go there yeah. when they're upset. <laughs> and we don't have to just think yeah. when we feel like we've gotten something yeah. we didn't think we deserved. Yeah. It's amazing. He's yeah. just there all the time <laughs> through thick and thin, right. through happy and sad. Yeah. 
but he doesn't just show up. When he showed up in my life, I was the happiest I was. And it, that kind of surprised me too. <laughs> because usually you expect it to be at a downtime, you yeah. know? He disappears because he wants to keep offering you wine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> drink I, I never did drink regularly. <laughs> However, um, you know, it gave me an appreciation for things sure. I just didn't think about. But right. his love is so quiet and constant that I understand now when people love me, yeah. I can feel it instead of not thinking I deserved it. Yeah. Or yeah. even thinking that it was there. Hmm. I'm okay yeah. already. So wherever else I go, it, it makes my life even richer. Yeah. So do your conversations now with Christ in a sense replace your conversations with God? Like, for example, when you pray, do you make a distinction between God and Christ or are they one and the same? And like, are you well, still a Muslim or do you? Okay. So I asked the question, am I still Muslim? Do you know what the answer was? He's quiet. Figure it out yourself. <laughs> yeah, well, no, Here's some he, wine. An <laughs> he answered that one. He answered that one. And then I had to figure out how his answer could be true. Was mm. he told me it is irrelevant. Mm. And I thought, how could it be irrelevant? It's a big, <laughs> fat deal down here. You don't understand. Right. And he just said it's irrelevant. Hmm. Because God is for everybody, and we need to believe that. Right, right. But we don't. We say it when we're in church. We say it when we're in the mosque. We say God is for everybody who believes this. Yeah. That's what we say. And then we walk out of the box, the church or the mosque, or the synagogue, or wherever it is we are. And then we look around at people, but they don't know what we know. Yeah. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. So it's it's irrelevant, but I know, like, it's a big thing for Muslims to say Jesus is not God in the flesh, right? So yep. you, message, you, you mentioned <laughs> that Christ is um, a messenger, but is, I mean, would you equate, Christ as God or a distinct person well, or being? I, I have to tell you, having seen Christ, there was, and this is a whole topic for another show, sure. um, but soon after I saw Christ, I left with Christ for a night. Hmm. And I was taken back home and I stood before God. And God is a pure light a pure white light that you like I can't say you stand in front of because when I was there I wasn't in my body I looked mm. like a, a seahorse like sure. a S shape and I was shown me before God before my soul entered the womb hmm. so that I was reminded of why I came here to do this because at first I tried to make Christ go away Right. And I know that sounds weird to say, but I didn't feel normal. Yeah. And I felt like, oh my gosh, what do I do? I didn't know if I could live up to it because, you know, my human side, obviously, when I didn't see Christ and he wasn't in front of me, all of a sudden I felt like, well, what do I do with all of this knowledge? Yeah. How do I bridge people? So well, how do I even know how to do it? what? Write books? <laughs> you know, all of that. I had no idea and I felt overwhelmed because I felt like I had to get started the next day because that's how we think. Yeah. So I was taken and I was shown how I agreed to share my free will with God so that that portal would be open enough for me to have received what I received when I received it in my life. Mm -hmm. And do you want to know something even crazier? All of my life, I knew that my life was going to change when I turned 40 years old. Right. I had no idea what that could have ever been. Never did I think that. But I knew it would. And every time I do something big along the way in my life, I remember I raised money for my kid's school or I, I started this program or whatever it was I did. And I think, oh, maybe this is it. Right. Oh, maybe that is it along the way. And then I'd go, but no, I'm not 40 yet. Yeah. Then I got divorced at 35 and I'm like, oh, wow. Hmm. But I didn't know that that was part of it. 
part of my preparation to accept what was coming. Right. And at 40, it was my birthday. On the day I turned 40, I sat around and waited and nothing happened. <laughs> <laughs> the next day, nothing happened. Right, right. Three weeks later, my birthday is March 23rd, April 11th, 2002. Hmm. I was 40 years old in that time for what, two, three weeks? And there it was. Yeah. So, so what would you say to someone? Because my listeners are a mixed group, but there are definitely Christians who listen. And there are different like kinds of Christians, I guess you could say. But some of them will acknowledge and say, yeah, you know, your, your experience was real, but it was probably demonic. You know, because it's, you know, Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Yeah, I've heard you know? that. So, one. what would you say to that kind okay. of reaction, real quick? Well, I will say, first off, that that's one of my favorites. <laughs> um, because it's so crazy that it, yeah. I had to make it to my like number one favorite. Yeah. And the reason it did is that I've never seen anything bad or scary. Right. I have been told there is no hell. Right. That why would God love you and then punish you? How could God do that to you? And he said, ask people, why would God burn you? Yeah. Um, my life's become cleaner. I've helped tens of thousands of people by now. Yeah. People who don't believe in anything and are going to pass and, and are stuck because they don't know where to go. Once they see me, they can leave because they, they just see something. I don't know what it is they see. <laughs> yeah. So I can't even tell you. But I do know when I get those calls, I go and I do know those people feel safe and beautiful yeah. and loved and they're able to leave. So as far as that goes, if someone says that, yeah. I, feel, I feel bad that that's what they think because that means that they think that they have a chance of going to that place too. Right, right. And that fear that they have is really separating them from God, let alone right. from me. I mean, whether they believe me or not is not in my hands. That's sure. one thing Christ sure. said to me is my job is only to speak and what people think about me is none of my business. Yeah. And and I understand that. And I, at first, it was hard for me because I tried to make it pliable to people. I tried sure. to dumb it down. I tried to break it down. I tried to say it my way. I tried to make people think that I was just like them or normal. And yeah. all that fell off. It just fell off. And yeah. the only thing that stayed is what I know. And that is that you are loved already, even if you call me whatever you want to call yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter to my life that you called yeah. me that, but it matters more to yours that you found it in yourself to right. say it. Right. And it would be so ironic, too, that you would have these experiences and someone would accuse it of being demonic or Satan and it's like Satan gives you so much love then. <laughs> I'm, I'm saying that if then we, we need to redefine things because, right, right. you know, that's why I say it's my favorite question because meeting me or seeing me, yeah, that's the last thing you would think. <laughs> and then if I would tell you that, then all of a sudden you'd think that, then you have to question why you don't even trust your own instincts. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I know we're running out of time for you because I know you have to get going yeah. somewhere. So, so what's next <laughs> for you? Um, what's next is I am going to do a tour okay. and I want to speak to children. I will speak to adults when I'm in those cities, but I want to speak to children and I'm writing up a paper right now. It's, it's a program actually called the seven pillars of self love. Hmm. And I want to teach people that loving yourself is the first thing that we need to do. Right. We've been taught it's selfish, yet it's the most selfish thing to not love yourself. Mm. And it is the gateway to your life because that's where Christ started with me. He didn't tell me, oh, so-and-so is not doing right and so-and-so is not doing this. Christ said to me, why are you doing this this way? Mm. Why do you feel you need that man, that job, that this, that, that to be okay? Why are you exaggerating stories? so that you can feel like you're one of everybody else. What's missing in you? Hmm. That teachings of self-accounting, once I answered to myself, I didn't need to answer to anyone else. Yeah. But what I found out, and we can end on this note, because it's probably the most true thing you'll ever hear, is that when you don't own your own vulnerabilities, 
anybody else can. Hmm. When you own your own vulnerabilities, nobody else can. Hmm. I know that one, that one, it's hard to own. Yeah. But it's a big one. Yeah. And and we yeah. can live up to that. We all have that capability. Yeah. Oh, that's that's good. That's good. How 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 can my listeners keep in touch with you? Um, I am actually now on Facebook. I have um, like an author page, and then I have my own personal page. They're under Nadia okay. Khalil Bradley, and I do the radio show. I do it five days a week, five okay. thirty in the morning Pacific time. So it's international. It's okay. on Blog Talk Radio called Christisms. And it is at 5.30, so you can listen to it in archives if you live in L.A. or on the <laughs> West Coast or yeah. in the Pacific time zone. Um, the, it's in archives. We're over 400 shows. I think we're at about 425. Oh, wow. Nice. And March will be two years, March 10th. And it is probably the best way to wake up in the morning nice. is to set your mind straight and take out the trash early on in the day so right. that you can enjoy your day. No, no, no. That, that's good. So if you guys need any encouragement, check out her show, Christisms, every morning. Um, I'll, I'll put some uh, info on that in the description. And, you know, be sure to check out Nadia's latest book, Original Love. And, of course, check out her other books, you know. So if you'd like to support the show financially and help keep it going, uh, that would really mean a lot. You can go to www.patreon.com slash Joshua Tungle. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Joshua Tungle. And so don't forget to subscribe to this podcast. And I'd really appreciate it if you can take a moment to write a review and rate it on iTunes because it'll allow more people to discover the show and help us reach a wider audience, which means we'll be helping more people along their journey. You know, so of course, please share this podcast with your friends. And so, Nadia, it's been a pleasure. Thanks so much for m making time this morning and yeah. for sharing your story and your experience and helping more people awaken to the truth of their hearts. So, thanks for being on the show. Thank you. And goodbye, everybody. Thanks for listening. All bye bye. Right. Alrighty, guys. Once again, thanks for listening. And I'll catch you guys on the flip side. All right, I'm out. Peace. Mm -hmm.